So when you said, so my name is Edwin. Uh, I studied at Stellenbosch. Okay. I did my three-year course, uh, BCom Actuarial Science, and then a year of honors after that. Mm -hmm. And I think initially at school, I didn't know about actuarial science. I thought I would probably become an accountant or something, because that's what most of the other kids did. Um, if you didn't become a rugby player, my yeah. school. Um, so I had that dream, but I think in like standard eight, when I was still playing for the B team, I realized that, that probably wasn't going to fly. Um, so I went to see a career, what do you call it, advisor, mm -hmm. who told me about it. And I think all that I knew at that stage is I enjoyed mathematics and science and sort of statistics and analytical side of things. And I think what she, what she sold to me is it's a universal degree. It gives you access to, to any country. It's challenging and it's analytical. Um, so on that basis, I started with it. But then obviously, subsequently, you discover a bit more about what it, what it really entails. Um, but, but actually, what I was surprised is that during varsity, I mean, you do your subjects, but you've got very little idea about what the real world yeah, what you really do. Like, I remember when I went to my first interview, they asked me, well, are, are you interested in life, general, or short-term, or investments? And I pretty much said, well, whatever you're offering, I mean, you, you, you don't really have, have a feel for it um, while you're studying. Yeah. But I think the thing that appealed to me the most was the fact that it was a challenge. Um, it was analytical, so it led me to think in a structured way. And that it was really, it just came down to problem solving. Because um, I mean, a lot of the technical stuff that I learned, the technical work I've never used uh, in my functions, theories. And, and I mean, and sometimes, sometimes you come across some of those, or like even just basic stuff about that, in the, nothing. I can't remember anything <laughs> about that. But uh, some of it's probably just sort of filtering the candidates to, uh, to, to see whether, whether it really appeals to you. But uh, what, what I've used is the fact that it teaches you to solve problems and to think along a logical, logical path. Yeah. Okay. I must say, I, I was also similar to you in the sense that my brother studied accounting. Okay. Um, so I was just in the mindset, yeah. okay, I'm also yeah. going to just study yeah. accounting. And then family friends said, you know, what about actuarial science? And I looked at it and also the whole fact that it was the challenge. It had the, yeah. like, this is the hardest degree. And I was like, I've heard people say that, but yes, I've seen like the amount of work that the accounting students had to go through, they had to study and engineers and stuff, and there's a couple of other degrees that I think that I personally would find a lot harder. Yeah. No, I mean, you look at a doctor and that's like yeah, double just like, the time period. And, and blood, having to yes. work with blood and guts and stuff. Oh, no. So I think, I think we, <laughs> we chose definitely the, the right one. Yeah. But, you want to tell us just a little bit more about your career path and how you yeah, ended so, up yeah, yeah, so after, so after, so after completing my honours, I went up, I studied down here in Stellenbosch, then I went up to Momentum in Centurion, so I started there. I worked in the valuations department for about two years, mm -hmm. um, like, doing, so that's sort of the, like doing the real technical actuarial work, reserving and lapse implications and modelling claims and new business and everything. I think I quickly discovered that some people are born for that. Like some people start with that and die doing that. Like really getting stuck into the numbers in a dark office somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think for other actuaries, it's valuable having that insight. Like understanding how business is valued and how important it is to, to have an accurate assumption of claims or lapses or policy growth or whatever. Having those building blocks was valuable for me. Because I think you use that in any business, in any business where actuarial is involved. Um, but I'm not that detail orientated, so I could only do about two years of it. Okay. Then I moved to um, life insurance product development for about three years, which is uh, still at the oh, But uh, in that role, it was more, you sort of more use that communication skills, that being that liaison between the understanding the actuarial part and how premiums are calculated and why you have this exclusion and whatever, and being able to explain that to brokers and consultants and the market out there. So that was a bit of those skills that I developed. Uh, then I moved back down to Cape Town about three years ago. Okay. I, I joined Sunlam. Um, initially, I was in the sort of the pricing team. So calculating premiums and 
product features and if we launch a new benefit, how many claims are we expecting? In, uh, I think they call it product management. Okay. And then about a year and a half ago, um, we started IndieFim. Oh, so, it was Indie, as, as old as that? Yeah, well, so um, that's when the project started, or that's when we got the brief. But it, I mean, it took us a while to figure out, because our brief was wide, our brief was figure out financial services for the millennial market. Oh. So I mean, it could have been anything, it could have been any product, any platform, anything. And so then we started the project to see, okay, but what do we start off, what do we offer, what is the pitch, what makes a difference? Um, and and initially, for instance, internally, we with Sunlum, we did a, we launched a product called GoCover. Okay. first, which is uh, instant accidental benefit. So it's an app you can buy on your phone, and you can buy up to a million rand of life cover on an accidental basis, so it doesn't, no underwriting, doesn't cover injuries, uh, it covers injuries, doesn't cover illnesses. But I mean, so if you want to go hiking or on a road trip or skiing, whatever, and you want cover but you don't want to go through forms and paperwork and have a deceased, you can buy it on your phone in 30 seconds. Okay. Four periods. Let's start now up to 30 days. The cover is for one day to 30 days. We launched that as an experiment actually to see how quickly can we get something out, um, how do people respond to that, how do we, and even internally in Sunlam, how do we manage the reporting and sign off and all of that in the numblest fashion. Okay. And, and how was that project? Was it a success? Is it going? Yeah, so, I mean, so for, for us, I think most of the learning was in how quickly we could we get it out. Because, and this is for some number, it's probably true for most financial, big financial services. Once you've got big systems, big legacy systems that it's administer policies done. from the 70s, it takes very long yeah. to get something new done. And everyone has got the best intentions, but just you can imagine any system is so complex that in order to do something new, you have to go figure, okay, how am I going to do this? Make sure you don't break all the other stuff, and test it, um, and then go through the approval process and everything. So, I mean, in all the companies that I've heard of, from the time that you have an idea, and this is not breaking the mold completely, it's launching a new benefit or premium pattern, um, from the time that you have an idea to where it gets implemented, is if you get that done in 12 months, that's flipping fast. Oh, wow. Normal normal cycles is is a bit longer than that. From the time that the idea is sort of hatched to when it gets when the guy can buy it. So so um, so what we had to do with GoCo is find out okay how do we go about doing stuff quicker? Because in this world, in this tech world, if it takes you 12 months to get something out, you're dead. By the time that you get something out, there's something way better, and the world has moved on. And I think we find that we find that quite interesting and challenging and exciting. The fact that this world moves so fast. Okay. And, and so tell me, is IndieFin is it a separate company or is it Sunlam? Yeah, the, it's a, uh, a wrapper around it. Yeah, that's a. It sort of depends on which way you look at it. So technically, it's a division within Sunlam. Okay. So not not a separate company, not even a separate FSP. Um, it belongs. It's a division. It belongs completely to Sunlam. The products that we sell is actually is sold under the Sunlum Life license. Okay. So in the contract, you'll see that it's a contract between you, the policyholder, and Sunlum. And Sunlum. Um, so, so in that sense, Indifin is a, is a, the brand that you see. But what we were very fortunate with is that they allowed us to do stuff completely independently. So the way that we onboard a client, the way that we interact with the client, the policy features. Um, the language, even the way that we run our team is completely independent. We've got full autonomy over that. In order to, because I think what Sunam has also learned is that Sunam is, any big company is very good at running this big ship that they are. But if you're launching a lifeboat off that, you need a different mindset and skills and way of working. So they've, so we're very fortunate in the sense that they've allowed us to, to do things differently, to try, to experiment. Um, speak differently, to uh, do ads that a big corporate wouldn't do, um, but they have the backing of Sunlum. 
Is there one like on your website you say we are both David and Goliath? Yes, exactly, okay. exactly. Because I think what we've also discovered is if we were a proper style like in a garage somewhere with a VC funder or something, mm -hmm. there's a lot of lessons that a big corporate learns over time that a startup would have to learn themselves, yes. which means failing and losing money. So, I mean, just in the compliance uh, support that we get, mm -hmm. we can tap into from Sunlum, the way that they assess claims, the knowledge in underwriting, um, the, all the legal minds there, the other actuaries that look at things and point out things to, um, to consider. I think, I think we, we're not ashamed of pointing it out that if we didn't have that, we're completely on our own. It would take us long and we'd make much more mistakes before we before we go to where we are now. Yeah. But I think the, the most interesting thing about the indie fund, uh, indie fund product is this concept of bounty. Um, I mean, so I, I look at bounty and maybe just explain if I'm, if I'm well, just uh, tell me if I'm getting this wrong. But I see it as I buy insurance with you guys, and what you do is you factor in like part of that premium goes towards an investment fund. And you say that in 20 years time, I'm going to get say 50,000 rand, and you're playing off the whole time value of money idea. And so I can't access the 50,000 rand right now. I have to wait, you know, so many years. But because money grows and continuously compounded, it can reach that rate. Am I correct in saying that's what yeah, the bounty is, or is it something? No, no, that's a, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the, that's some of the some of the essence of it. I think. I mean, when we looked at what. What do other guys have? Mm -hmm. Sorry, to to reward you for for buying insurance. Because the problem with insurance traditionally mm -hmm. is that you life insurance. You pay money every month in case something terrible happens. Yes. Something terrible doesn't happen, and you've been there for thirty years. There's nothing that you have access to. There's nothing that you've built up. Yes. So if you leave after thirty years, you've got nothing. You've had peace of mind during that time. But there's no way to reward you for flying stay of day. Uh, okay, so what some guys have done is they've done a cash back or premium back, where they say, okay, you'll get, after 15 years if you haven't claimed, we'll give you all your premiums back yeah. in nominal terms. Uh, the big problem, so one of the values of Indie Fin is that we want to be transparent. We want people to understand what they have. We don't want to hide behind clever marketing talk, whatever, to to get you to buy something that ends up being something else. For, so our pain with the, with the cashback message is, you'll see some TV ads that say, in 15 years time, you're going to get 40,000 rands, and then the guy says, okay, I'm going to take my family on overseas holiday. But obviously, no, we, anyone that knows anything about inflation, inflation knows, knows that in 15 years time, with that 40,000 rand, I think if you get getting nice now, You've yes. done well. Well, but that's the thing is, in my family, um, my parents are a little bit skeptical about insurance because my grandfather bought out all these policies that had nominal values. Yes. And he's yes. like, wow, yes. you exactly. know, in 10, exactly. 20 years' time, I'm going to make so much money, I'm going to be exactly. so wealthy, I'm going to be so rich. But, like you say, inflation, especially yes. in South Africa, caught everybody off guard. Yeah. And that, you know, wow, 20,000 Rand, we, when he was doing it, could have bought him an entire house. Yeah. Now couldn't even like change the tires on his car. <laughs> exactly. You know, it, it's, and so it was, it was quite depressing yeah. in a sense. So, so it's weird. My parents have got a very, so they don't have any life insurance. Um, I don't have any life insurance, yeah. which is weird. I mean, being studying actuarial science there, you know. No, 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 but uh, I mean, I mean, I think that's a, okay, so maybe let me just explain, I just finish the concept of bounty. Yes. Um, I can mention something about this, what type of insurance you need. So, so what bounty, our bounty works is if you come today and you take out a policy, then based on your age and your premium, we say, okay, there's an amount that's invested for you and it's a very significant amount. Mm -hmm. For instance, if you're 30 years old and your premium is 500 rand a month across all your benefits, you'll get about 50,000 rand that's invested for you. Mm -hmm. The difference is that is in today's money and that gets invested and you can then choose, do you want those 50,000 to be invested in equity or bonds or property or cash or whatever, you get the return according to what you're investing in. But all the growth is yours. Okay. So it's 50,000 rand in today's money 
if in a year's time it's grown to 55,000, then you've got 55,000. So the concept is different. So we're not telling you you're going to get this amount in future. We're giving you a big amount today, and that and amount grows, which should keep up at least within, depending on what you invest in, but should keep up mm -hmm. um, within, with inflation. Also, every time that your premium increase, we throw more into the pot. This whole pot is accessible at the end, at, at 70, but also every five years, there's a portion of that um, that you can cash out and do whatever you want with. No, no, the skeptic in me always says, if something sounds too bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, We've got that, yeah. <laughs> so so what, what, is the, what is the catch, in a sense? Are the premiums a little bit more expensive than a traditional insurance? Or, or how did you design the product? Yeah, I, I'm sure Indy Finn wants to make money. You we know, need, you're not we, a charity. We need, we need to make money. I, I, think, I think one of, the, one of the other things that's valuable of having this backing of Sunlum is that, I mean, anyone can do a startup and say, take cover with me, I'm going to pay your claim. But there also needs to be trust that that company is still going to be there in 10 years' time, and 3 years' time, and 50 years' time when you need your claim paid. Mm -hmm. um, so, Inifin has got the backing of Sunlum, that means Sunlum will stand in to pay the claims, but also it needs to be a sustainable business yes. in order to, to make business sense. Um, so, uh, the way that we looked at it is when we priced it, is yes, so if you look at what you're going to pay out on bounty, obviously, even in present value terms, if you had two policies, then obviously the one with bounty has an extra outgo mm -hmm. that, that you need to factor in. However, especially with this type of market, uh, the premium that you pay is heavily dependent on what we as a company need to pay in order to get a customer on the books. So the advertising that we need to do and the marketing campaigns and everything that we need to do to, to get a customer on the books. And the cheaper we can acquire a client that, the cheaper the premium becomes. Okay. Um, because our premium, literally, cost of acquisition plus claims plus expenses and profit. So, so, so there's two factors, the cost that you acquire clients at and how long they stay with you. And the other big problem that a business has that doesn't use uh, intermediaries to sell the policy, so when a client can come and buy himself, that they have very high lapses traditionally, okay. even in excess of 30% a year. Okay, wow. Which is because clients are buying it themselves and um, there's no pressure from the broker to you better keep that policy in force because so I'm making a commission on no it. So so, so at the moment, we're selling direct. Okay. So when you, come, when you come to us, you're interacting with us direct. We're also working on a proposition to allow advisors to, to sell it because we don't think it's either this or that. We think the best model is to allow you to interact with us in the way that you want to. Whether it's yourself or whether you want to use a broker, we'd like to offer you the choice as a client. Um, but So when we look at the price, when we determine the price, we what we assume is that if we've got this concept of bounty, that should attract, because it's an attractive feature. It, it, it's a world first from what we've seen. The fact that we invest the amount on day one and you get all the growth. We haven't seen that mm -hmm. somewhere else. So we, and I mean, that really allows us to tell you, look, come and take out a policy and you'll get 50,000 or 100,000 or whatever invested. So the upside is that we don't have to spend that much marketing in order to, uh, to acquire clients. So you could, you, you, we expect that we'd get more clients for the same marketing money with this feature as opposed to without it. Plus, we, we hope that they'll stay longer with us, which is obviously in the client's best interest once they build up Bounty to, to stay with us. Mm -hmm. And those two factors mean that actually, if we had to offer another pro policy that didn't have Bounty, and we priced that policy as a different entity or whatever, and we had to do marketing on that policy and assume the worst persistency, that policy holder would end up paying more okay. because it's more expensive to get them on to the books the and we assume that they, that they lapse earlier. Because I mean, this is the interesting thing about insurance is that people are coming up with these creative ideas. I mean, there was also that there's probably I think it was called Channel for Life, where it was a referral system or a marketing network. So I would then sell insurance to my friends, and then I'd get a little bit of their, their premium. Um, and I think Sunlum was involved with them somehow. I don't know if they were using the license or, uh. or something like that, but. I don't think they've been as successful as you know how, as how they wanted yeah. to be, um, and it, it's almost 
I mean, we're seeing an insurance not much has been disrupted so far. Yes, I mean, yes, and that's scary. I mean, like, the, yes, there's this new thing called lemonade that's come up in the States, but I don't have the highest of hopes for that. Um, in South Africa, like I did in my last interview, was pineapple. Um, they're also promising, you know, something different. But is insurance one of those things where it's been figured out? That's how it works. There's no really more room for this innovation. No, absolutely not. I think there's a lot of room for innovation. And I think you see that most evidently when you look at the process of what does it take to buy insurance, to buy life insurance. Okay. Kind of traditional process. You sit down with a broker and he figures out what your needs are and he goes away and pulls up a quote, comes back, second meeting, gives you a quote. And now he's like, I want this benefit and that benefit and change it. And they say, okay, that's what it's going to cost. Now you fill in the application form with paper and lots of pages. It gets sent off to them to the underwriters and look at this and say, okay, but for your life, now we need this blood test. You need to get that doctor's appointment because we need to know whether you're healthy. And you need to tell us more about how often do you fly and when do you dive and stuff. You give them the information and get the test done. It goes back to them and they say, okay, so based on all the facts now, your premium's a bit more than what we told you initially but because new facts have come to light, then you say, okay, but now I want less cover. Um, goes back to them, the reinsurers have to say whether they're happy with the case. And the whole process has got multiple handoffs between the broker and the underwriter and the admin person and the reinsurers or whatever. And it takes a long time. It can take up to six weeks to, well, as long as that. to, to, get, to get a policy. Now, I think the scary thing is when you work in the industry, you're so used to that's the way it is, that it doesn't shock you. If you're used to ordering an Uber now, yeah, it's stop you in five minutes, or Airbnb, or buying something online, and everything is instant. I mean, the example that I like to think of is that if you want a date, you can go onto dating sites and get a date yeah, you tonight. You swipe, <laughs> you swipe right a couple of times. Yeah. But if you want to buy life insurance, you go through this process. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that for me is the clearest example of the fact that the life insurance industry has to evolve and will evolve. Um, and I think that's why we think that that what we do will add value. And I think in a couple of years' time, it will it will be the norm that you can take out insurance on your phone in a couple of minutes and have a quality product. Everyone will move there. Um, so it's just about figuring out what's the best way to, uh, to get there. It, it, it's weird because insurance is one of those things where you need to educate the consumer about Absolutely. It, Absolutely. You do it in a way that isn't depressing. Like I was reading through your website and you and you like you, you start talking about the I was reading the what's it called? The disability one. Yeah. That would probably be the one that yeah. I would yeah. take up. Yeah. And they're like they're like, okay yeah, that was depressing. And it it is quite yeah. It's, yeah, I no, think we don't like to talk about no, death, no, we don't no, like no. to talk about losing our eyesight. So, I mean, so, so the easy way to market it is to, is, to, is to go along that route, to say, do you know one in every three people get cancer? Do you know there's a very good chance if you're smoking you're going to die in the next 10 years? And it's it's easy, yeah. to, easy to, use, to use the scare tactic. I think what our philosophy is that insurance is good, insurance is a social good. Mm -hmm. The fact that um, if something happens to me, my wife and my kids can get an income. Or as long as I would have worked uh, to sort them out, uh, to I mean to, to help cover for them, that is a very very good principle. And the fact that everyone pays a small amount monthly, and whoever are the unlucky ones that have to claim quickly can get this big payout. So I mean it's really pooling of risks and and a whole community and everyone in the fund contributing together so that whoever has the bad luck is financially. Uh, sorted by the product. So that's a very good system. Uh, I think the problem is that the, it, it's such a hack to, to get a policy, mm -hmm. uh, to go through this process in order to get covered. Plus, the products are so complex that I think they are actuaries in the market who don't understand yes. how it works. And that's just the beast that we've created because everyone tries to differentiate on product. So adding features and bells and whistles and Another thing that you need to decide on, and do I want my premium to grow by 5% or 5.5%? So there's such a lot of features that you have to negotiate. Well, it, it, it and there's no way that the client can know what's best. Yeah, I mean, it, 
it becomes incredibly difficult for, say, someone like me who studied this stuff to compare to the two products. It's because virtually there's impossible. There's excesses, there's, like yes. you say, this one's got an exclusion, this one's got a, pre yes. a premium yes. increase, yes. this one's got uh, a limit, and you're like, unless you've got like a calculator and a model, and then and there's so many that are offered out on the market, that yes. there's a lot uh, of confusion. Yes. Which, I think for some re for some people that then just makes them just not make a choice. Exactly, that, that's exactly what happens. So that's exactly what our philosophy is. We try to keep it as simple as possible. Mm -hmm. So we don't offer choice on our premium brokes or what is the waiting period before disability product starts or when does it end mm -hmm. or how long. You, normally, something stupid. You have to decide: Do you want your rates guaranteed for five years, ten years, fifteen years, twenty years, all of life? And you pay a different premium for each of those options. But the guy on the street doesn't have a clue on what's best for him. Yeah. And where he's making a good choice, and then exactly doesn't make a choice. So on anything where, I mean, retail, anything that you buy online, there are too many points where you have to make decisions, you just drop off. You just yell. So our philosophy has been that we have designed our products and our process to be as simple as possible. So you don't have to make unnecessary choices. So we'd rather create something that's best for the majority mm -hmm. uh, to try and cater for every single niche need and to have a product with a contract of 200 pages because you've got all of this complexity yeah. that you need to, to try and understand. So we, try, we intentionally keep our products as simple as possible mm -hmm. um, but still delivering high quality that we ourselves buy. Yeah. Um, I think that's our motto. We need to design, because it's easy to design a crappy product that there's lists and lists of exclusions that you don't pay for. Um, but then you also have to ask yourself, is that something that you'd buy yourself? Yes. So we, our philosophy is we create, we create a product that we are happy to buy ourselves in the first place, and then it should be good enough for, for the market. Because, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, there's, there's this stories of people who bought say funeral insurance and they've been screwed over because yeah. it didn't include this type of death and families are left cold so i know there's a lot of anger around the insurance uh, industry and uh, that was one of the things a company like lemonade said that we're only going to make so much profit on each policy mm. if there's any um risk profit that we're going to make choose a charity and we're yeah. going to donate it to that and i see pineapple also want to try and go this whole transparent route saying we're also going to take just a set fee and the rest gets kind of you know distributed to yeah. people and lower premiums going yeah. forward does indie see that the need for transparency or limiting their own profit as an important component and if so how would they yeah I, I, I think transparency is massively important mm -hmm. um, i mean just being so, uh, i mean and it's i mean something simple like Making your engagement with clients uh, in the questions that you ask, making it easy to understand what are you asking them, or in your contract wording, or when we chat to clients, whatever. Having humans that talk human language as opposed to massively technical jargon. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think transparency is, is is in every part of the business, not just in um, how much profit do we make. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got an articles, we've got a section on our uh, on our website. That, with a list of articles on what is this benefit and can I skip premiums and what happens if this happens to explain all the features. And one of our articles actually um, states how much profit. Now, obviously, you make a different amount of profit on different benefits, but it gives a, gives a clarification of how much of your premium goes to covering your risk, how much covers expenses, and how much is left for profit. And we're not scared to, to, to put that out there. Uh, in life insurance, obviously, it's a bit different than short term uh, because we need to build up a uh, reserve. Yes. So, so we need to keep some money back for the guys going to claim. If we've just got five guys paying premiums uh, and, one and, 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 and one doesn't claim that year, we can't give all the money back because next year when someone claims, you need you need a reserve in order to pay it up. But we absolutely believe that you have to be transparent in, 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 in your whole business. Yeah. And, and tell me, have you guys gone live yet? Like, can, yeah. can you go and... You can go and buy, yeah. We, so, I mean, so our strategy is that we so we need to introduce this brand, Indifin, to the market. So our first radio ad started this week Okay. Um, on KFM and I felt. And you'll, you'll hear when you listen to the ads also, it's much more informal, um, tongue-in-cheek. It's it's a different kind of voice that we, that we speak with. 
so that's all of this week. We uh, we obviously we optimizing our site in the process and everything the whole time because I think that's this kind of industry and offering a product in this on this channel digitally allows you to improve it as you see our clients interact with you and as you become aware of what clients want because at the end of the day I think if if you launch something and you leave and you say that's what it's going to be you're missing out. Um, so we are continuously making changes to how do you get to the quote screen, how do we explain these features to you based on the feedback that we get. And we're lucky that our clients so far have been willing to, we've got a live chat for instance, and they've been willing to tell us, I don't understand this, what do you mean here? Um, for instance, initially when you got to our quote screen, you had to choose what you want, and if you, if you went ready to buy, you have to come through the process again, you have to fully know this again. And the client said, "But um, I'd like to buy, but I can come back tonight. Um, can I? Can you save my progress?" We said, "Okay, obviously that makes sense." Mm-hmm. So we added that feature that you can save your progress and come back to it. So we're adding features the whole time to try and make it a better experience um, for clients. And, and you don't have to answer this question. It, <laughs> it is sensitive. But how many people have signed up so far? Has it been more than expectations, or are you still a little bit behind? Yeah, so, 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 so the way that we look at it, there was different ways that we could do this from the start. So we could have, the traditional way would have been to wait, um, build a prototype, get it out in the market and test it with people and make changes and play around with it until we believed it's optimal and then launch it. But then you end up getting closer to that 12 month release cycle before you go out. Mm-hmm. What we tell ourselves is we want to go out as quickly as possible. We want to have that ability for someone to buy as soon as we're sure that we've reached the minimum criteria. Um, and that way, obviously it takes longer to, to build up clients because the first thing that you, uh, there's, uh, I think the guy from the founder of LinkedIn said, if you aren't ashamed of your first version, you waited too long yeah. to launch. So, I mean, that's a bit of a cliche, but we, even now, when we look back at what our process was like, what our first quote screen was like, we think, like, okay, that was minimum. Um, it's improved now, and we know, I mean, in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to have a better version already. So, so our strategy was to get out as quickly as possible. The phase that we're in now is that we're optimizing our process. So, what do you see when you land on the page? How do we give you? How do we explain what our products are? How do we explain bounty to clients so they understand? How do we um, how do we show clients how to get a quote uh, when they get to the quote screen? What do they see? There's a lot of that that we're optimizing at the moment. We started our marketing campaign, mm-hmm. but I think we probably anticipate that in the next two to three months we would tell ourselves that now we're ready. Now we've done the we live we're selling policies at the moment. But I think in about two or three months' time we'll be at a stage where we're saying okay this first initial step of improving the, the product has been done and we're at a stage now where we can really send traffic there to uh, to, to see what happens because at the moment we can spend a bit on advertising see traffic coming through uh, see what people are experiencing and then make improvements and, and do it again okay. so so we're at that stage where we're still getting I think getting our initial um, offering optimized before before we can really open the, the taps and make a big world about it. Yeah. You're kind of using the whole actual control cycle. Right? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, exactly you what you it find is, the yeah. problem, you develop exactly. the solution, exactly. and then you monitor it, and it's that feedback. That's, that's exactly what it is. The problem with the industry is because you've got a legacy system, it takes, it takes you 12 months to do that. Okay. So by the time that you launch, uh, you've got a new problem. <laughs> Whereas we are really cognizant of the fact that we need, it's all about getting the speed of that cycle mm-hmm. quicker and giving it time down as much as possible. Because if you can, if you agile, you can move fast and improve it, you've got a much better chance of, of being successful. So that, I think that is the key ingredient for us, getting that actual control cycle, mm-hmm. getting that to, to work much quicker than what the, what the norm is. And, and who would you say is Indifan's biggest competitor? Like, does Old Mutual have some of the same millennials or the other startups? What, yeah, who are you guys worried about? We, we haven't seen something like we all internationally that we think is great, that we think is awesome, and we think we'll copy everything. We see features, we see a nice feature here, 
nice way that they do premium calculations or contract wording or client communication, we learn from, from different features. We haven't seen one compelling offering internationally that we think is the golden standard in life insurance. There's a lot of guys that do um, very quick life insurance where you can buy in 30 seconds, okay. but then you buy accidental cover or cover with millions of exclusions. So offering quality, fully underwritten benefits online with a seamless process, um, I don't know, I, I haven't seen that yet. I mean, also, I think our market still has to evolve for people to to go online to buy insurance themselves. Our market still has to has to grow into that, and that might, I mean that might take years. Uh, but that's why also it's important for us to get our distribution proposition out, where an intermediary can sit with you and say, "Well, I'll take you through the process, and you can do a lot more yourself." It's enabling clients to to help themselves because I think that's a modern client. I mean, for myself, I want to, I don't want to sit with a travel agent and let them send me quotes of flights. I want to sit around and play and see, okay, if I fly here, what is the cost and how can I connect to another flight? You want to be informed yourself. Yes. You want to be in control. Have that, have that kind of thing. Okay, cool. I mean, look, it's, let's say, I mean, someone who's, who's at university, um, studying actuarial science, I think you know, most of my subscribers are, are very much in that situation. Uh -huh. um, if they would you advise them to come to Indy for now, or would you wait for, or advise them to wait until they working, getting a salary? No, I mean, I, I, sorry, that's the thing that, uh, that I wanted to say initially. That I mean, so like someone in someone who doesn't have debt, mm -hmm. doesn't need a lot of life cover. But the problem is that also that if you don't know the industry, you don't need, you don't know what products are, are best for you. So for instance, if you just start working, you don't have debt, you don't have dependents, all that you really need is to protect your income. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so through our process, when you tell us, well, I don't have dependents, I don't have debt, this is how old I am, this is what I'm earning, we can help you to, um, when you, when, if you want, uh, when you get to the quote screen to say, well, in your situation, it would make sense to take this benefit because you've told us this is your need. You want to protect your income, and this benefit does that exactly. Um, I mean, I think anyone at university, for instance, doesn't need to protect debt or whatever. But I mean, they might want a cover for cancer or some serious illnesses because I think that's the one thing we used to think that heart attacks and strokes and cancer, all of that, happens to old people. No, I, I think everyone these days knows someone who's had cancer, for instance. I mean, you might just want to buy some cancer cover. Um, but uh, I think what we're trying to do is not only sell products, but also offer a lot of financial education. Because if people, we, we know that, I mean, there's no doubt about it, that the level of financial literacy in South Africa is appalling. Mm -hmm. And I think industry, financial product providers need to do more to to educate clients about what they need and what are, what's the best and, and just to explain why do you need insurance, how does it work, even how does interest work, where to invest in, mm -hmm. all of that, like even base level of detail. So what we're also busy with, and some of the articles are there already, is information that just explains more around financial, financial literacy almost, um, in a sense, because I think if clients are more empowered and are more knowledgeable, they can make better decisions. Okay. Hey, look, I mean, I think you've, we've done very nice with the interview, so I'm going to ask just <laughs> one last question, but um, so I'm going to ask it, but feel free to also add in anything else that you that you want to say or any last thing. Um, but John, where, where do you see the future for, for Indifin? What is the, the grand vision? Is the vision to just stay in South Africa? Is it to go international? Is it to create an artificial intelligence that so the entire process is automated? Uh, what, what do you see the future is? I think one of the things that I personally find most exciting about Indifin is that we don't know what we're going to be busy with in Feb next year. Okay. We sort of, we look where we are now, like two months ago we thought we would be working on different stuff now we really learn and discover a lot as we go. Having said that, our idea is obviously to be, at the moment we offer life insurance, is to offer the whole suite of financial services. Okay. Short term, maybe banking, investments, 
ability to invest offshore. Whatever our clients want, we want to we want to develop, and not just for the South African market. I think a lot of the a lot of the principles about making products simple, making it easily accessible, taking the friction away, is what you need wherever you want to do it. Yeah. It's obviously some country and region specific stuff that you need to take into account, but I think the the philosophy that we use um, allows you to 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 build products anywhere that you that you can get the right partners. So so we're very excited about about and I mean while we don't know what this is going to be like in. In five years' time, we're very excited to do what it can become, yeah. <laughs> okay, no, perfect. Thank you. Uh, we, we do have uh, the coffee shop asking us to pay the bill <laughs> and, and get out of the place. Well, so kick us out. <laughs> so we, we are going to end the interview there. But thank you so much for coming and spending time with us. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Awesome. Enjoyed it. Thank you, <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I'll just turn it off, yeah. <laughs>